Next is uh, Taj Draya from the Digital Currency Initiative. Okay, hello everyone. Good morning, early, it's still 9.30, right? Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about, oh, there's interesting colors. Okay, well, you can still read it. Um, going to talk about node modes, uh, taxonomy of uh, Bitcoin network nodes, and an additional one. Um, so this is, it's UTXO, but I guess what happened, like James was saying initially, hey, James, the James Lovejoy, head of the Bic MIT Bitcoin Club, said, well, don't give a talk about UTXO because you already did that last year. So I was like, oh, okay. And then I started a different set of slides, and then on the schedule it says UTXO. So I was like, well, sort of do both. Um, so quick intro, I'm Tad Dreja, work on Bitcoin, uh, work I've done in Bitcoin in the last few years. So I wrote the Lightning Network paper with Joseph Poon a bunch of years ago. Uh, discrete law contracts, which I talked about yesterday. Um, current work is uh, UTXO, which I'll talk about today. Okay, so what is a node? Um, apparently, it comes from the Latin word for not. I didn't know that until a few weeks ago, looking this up. Um, so like it, I don't know, not. But in graph theory, we're sort of thinking of the dots, not the lines, right? Graph theory is the study of lines between dots. Um, and in Bitcoin and similar networks, we're thinking of like an endpoint, some kind of entity, the, the, the things that are talking to each other in Bitcoin. So what does a node do? So that sort of begs the question, well, what does Bitcoin even do? What are, what are we, what is this whole Bitcoin thing? What are we trying to do? Well, we want to just send and receive Bitcoins, which is sort of circular definition, I guess. But really, it's, it's anything we can send and receive that works. Uh, the hard part is that we want everyone to agree on all those sends and receives, right? The consensus part. So we want to have a, a system where I can send you a Bitcoin, you can send me a Bitcoin, but everyone else in the entire system agrees that yes, you received it, I received it. So how do we do this? So I'm gonna list the things to do in Bitcoin. Um, and this is not necessarily exhaustive, uh, but it's a pretty good breakdown of, of what there is to do and how hard and easy these things are. So I'll go, through, I'll, I'll go through in detail through these slides, but um, so what are the things you can do in Bitcoin? Well, you can propagate messages. Um, that's, you know, the, the basic communication layer of, oh, I found a block, or here's this mess here's this transaction, or I'm sending coins. Uh, so the transactions and the messages, you propagate them between the different nodes. Um, this is actually not too hard. Uh, you can send coins. That's one of the, the main things you want to do. You want to send people money. Um, you can serve blocks. So we have this blockchain. I guess I haven't really, probably people here know that there's a blockchain and that's sort of how we do all these things. Um, and you can serve those blocks to people. So if people say, hey, what happened in you know, 2011? Uh, and someone needs to fill you in on all those blocks from years ago. Um, and then you can check work or check those blocks. So check that this whole proof of work consensus system is actually happening and perform that consensus check. You can also check transactions and signatures. Um, which is not necessarily the novel thing in Bitcoin. It's not the consensus mechanism itself, but you're making sure that the things endorsed by the consensus mechanism are themselves correct. And then you can receive coins, which seems like it should be linked to send coins, but these are sort of ordered easy to hard. Um, and receiving coins is actually much harder than sending them. Uh, and then you can mine. So you can generate new Bitcoins by mining a block. and That's the hardest thing of all. Okay, so I'll, I'll go in some more detail. So propagate messages. Um, all you really need is an IP address and a little bit of RAM. Um, it's actually really easy to sort of receive a message, send it on to someone else. Uh, do some DNS requests, find some other nodes, talk to them. There's, you know, there's a wire protocol, there's handshakes and stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I programmed an implementation that would do it. It's not that bad. Um, you don't have, it's pretty forgiving. So I guess in Lightning, I know, I know well, probably rusty, I don't want to name names, but you know, close the channel. Um, <laughs> in Bitcoin, they don't really, at least Bitcoin Core, it's not gonna hang up on you unless you, you do some really crazy stuff. Um, so it'll say like ver and it wants a verac and you just don't send a verac and it's probably okay for a while. Or like ping and you're supposed to pong and you just don't and it usually works. Um, so <laughs> so you, can, you, you can get away with a lot of you know, non-standard things. Um, there's also some software that looks like a node but isn't. Or, or maybe is, depending on your definition. Uh, I think someone wrote this like four or five years ago, sort of as a joke, but it's called pseudonode. And what it does is it runs on a computer, connects to Bitcoin nodes, and then anytime someone, say, asks for a block, it just 
asks someone else for a block and then gets it and then sends it to the, that person. So it, it, but it looks like it's a node and it knows everything uh, and it you know receives transactions, forwards them on to everyone, but it has no idea what's going on, right? It's just sort of parroting, you know, it receives something, sends it, but it's actually not bad for the network, right? So you, you have this and it's sort of doing a service. It's propagating messages and to some extent um, obfuscating where these transactions are coming from as it's relaying. So, I mean, that is a node. It's, like, it's called pseudo node, so it's not like a very good one, but you know, it does that. So messaging part is pretty straightforward. Um, sending coins. Sending coins is actually pretty easy. You just need a private key uh, you know, you, that's to sort of prove ownership of your coins. That's what, you know, makes the coins yours. Uh, you also need to know where the coins are. So it's not just the private key. You need to know your UTXO. So in what block, you know, what's the TX ID and index? Uh, and what's the amount? Because if you don't know the amount, you could easily screw up and send the wrong amount. Um, and yeah, but hardware wallets with fairly minimal computational power do this. Um, so you can, you can write a quote unquote wallet. Like if you were, you were writing a send only wallet, it's sort of like an afternoon job given the cryptography libraries there um, because the signing process is not too hard. Um, so yeah, that, that's not too bad. Uh, serving blocks. So when people want to sync up their new nodes, uh, they need someone to give them the blocks. That is actually not too hard. Um, it takes a lot of space, so you need you know, 280 gigabytes, I guess. Well, no, another thing that's sort of new. Uh, if you look in your folder, it's 280 gigs in the blocks folder. A good 30 or 40 gigabytes of that is revision data. Uh, so the actual blocks are only about 240 right now. Um, but yeah, you have to store a lot of data, but it's sort of, you're just a file server. Someone comes up and asks, hey, can you give me this block? And you just send it to them. Uh, there's almost no computation involved. Um, you can also do this sort of in the cloud. You can have a, you know, a block, a node that has all the blocks on AWS, and that's fine. You're not trusting the blocks. You're, you're verifying them yourselves. Um, so this is one of the things where you can sort of outsource it, and you can say, well, someone else will do it. I, you know, I, I, can, I don't have to worry too much. Um, yeah, so that's cloudable. But most of these verification steps are not cloudable. You want to run it on your own computer, not on someone else's. So verifying the work done, this sort of heaviest chain, most work, Nakamoto consensus algorithm, um, is getting trickier. It's a little more involved, and this is sort of, I think, one of the, the big ideas in Bitcoin was like, hey, let's do this consensus mechanism based on proof of work. Um, it's not too hard, right? You, you get all these block headers, you sort of have to decide, decide between them, adjust the difficulties. Um, they're not too big. Uh, it's maybe 50 megabytes total for the last 11 years of Bitcoin. Um, and you can also throw them away. I think no one does, because they're not that big, but you could throw away old, old headers after a while. Um, and so then you get a good idea of what's going on, right? You say, okay, here's the latest block hash, and we all agree on this hash. And then you, as long as everyone else is enforcing the other rules, you have a pretty, pretty safe, in practice, idea of what's going on. Um, but the other rules are the hard part, so checking the transactions and signatures. Um, this is, hard. People are sending coins, but is, are these transactions correct? And so, you know, do these coins exist? Someone's saying, oh, I'm sending coins from over here, and I'm sending it to this other place. So do the coins they're spending exist? And they're not spent yet, right? They, no one's double spending. Um, are they the right out points? Uh, there's enough coins. Uh, what kind of keys? What kind of signatures? All these script opcodes. There's this interpreter where there's this whole weird fourth stack-based thing going on. And well, what about the clean stack rules? And like, it's not consensus, but it's a, a policy thing. And this whole low S thing and op code separator. I have no idea what code separator does, but it's in there and it, it's scary. And then you've got sig hashes and sometimes things have to be old enough. So it's, it's really complicated. This is the scariest part. And I think this is what, when people say, you know, don't implement your own node, don't write your own Bitcoin node. Uh, this is the part they're talking about, right? You write your own wallet. Well, it's also a little scary, but uh, write your own you know, network propagation messages. Uh, you might get kicked off the network, uh, but you're probably not gonna you know, do anything too damaging. But this is, this is the hard part. Um, and then receiving coins. If you wanna receive a coin, you basically have to do all of these things that, oh, they're really dark on the screen. Oh, it's not as dark on the monitor. Um, <laughs> they, they, you have to do all this stuff above it, right? So you have to check that the works to get the right consensus uh, points and 
you know, check all the transactions to make sure there's not something weird going on. Um, so you have to sort of do all those things above it. And of course, propagate messages. You have to receive these messages, check the blocks. Because um, you don't want to say you've gotten paid until you're sure that everyone else agrees and everyone else thinks that this person's gotten paid. Um, and then mining. Well, mining is just an enormous amount of work, right? You, you, that, that's got to be the hardest thing because you've basically got to do all those previous steps and, and maintain consensus, check everything. And then you've got to just try a bazillion uh, headers to try to find a valid block. Um, so it's sort of you know all the previous things and then a bunch of extra work that you need like a warehouse full of ASICs to do. So OK, those are all the, in, at least in white instead of dark gray, um, all the things you got to do. And now, what about full nodes? So this is a term that I guess is not super well defined or people definitely disagree on it. Um, so some people will say, you know, well, full means everything, right? You got to do all these things to be a full node. Um, at least for the people I hang out with working on Bitcoin, uh, we, we have a definition for, you know, what is, is full. Uh, and it's just these two. Basically, um, it's, a, it's, you know, you maintain consensus. So you can have a full node that is sort of a dead end, endpoint, and it's not even propagating network messages. You can have a full node with no wallet attached to it. So no sending coins, no receiving coins. Um, you can have a full node that doesn't have any blocks and doesn't mine. It, the main thing that a full node does is it's fully validating, right? So it checks the proof of work, checks all the consensus rules, uh, verifies the whole history, keeps track of the current state. Um, and then just, you know, as a term, so the history is the blockchain. The blockchain is all the things that have gone on for the last 11 years. And then the current state of who owns what, that's the UTXO set, unspent transaction output set. Um, so, and then there's variants of full nodes. So if you, if you accept the definition that full node means fully validating, then you can say, okay, well, we can now have a pruned full node where you validated all these old blocks, but you threw them away. So you can't serve them to other people. You can't prove to someone starting out that this is the correct state of the system. But you know that for yourself, that you have verified it for yourself and you know the correct state of the system. Or the opposite would be an archive full node where you have all the history as well. And so if anyone else wants to uh, come online, you can convince them. You can give them all the data so they can figure it out for themselves that here's the current state of the system. Um, and then there's these sort of optional things. You can have like a transaction index. Uh, and in Bitcoin Core, that's an option in the configuration. So you can sort of remember where every transaction happened. So given a transaction identifier, you can say, oh, it was in this block. Here it is. And give it. Um, by default, it does not have a transaction index. So by default, old transactions that have all been, you know, all the outputs have been spent, you forget about them, not completely. Like they're still maybe in your blocks file, but you don't know where. Right, so if someone says, hey, this transaction I made in 2015, uh, you'd have to go through and try to just find it. Uh, also an address index. Uh, this keeps, an ad it keeps track of all the addresses used and in what transactions those addresses were used. Um, block explorers usually use this. There is no option to do this in uh, Bitcoin Core. Uh, many people have suggested and made pull requests, uh, but there's sort of, it's seen as maybe not the best idea uh, to, for people to rely on these kinds of things. It also gives a not great idea about what an address is because people sort of think that you know addresses own coins or like addresses are where the coins live. But really it's UTXOs where the coins live and UTXOs happen to have sort of an address label posted on them. Um, and then there's the idea of SPV, which um, is you know mentioned in the, the original Bitcoin paper. And the idea of an SPV client is in, dis in, in contrast to a full node, it doesn't have the UTXO set. It doesn't have the current state of the system. Um, so they assume that a block is valid only from the proof of work. Uh, so in that, okay, well, yeah, they, they, they check the proof of work, so they check the block, but they don't check the transactions. Um, SPV nodes can't check signatures uh, because they don't know what the public key even is to be able to check them. Uh, they can't check that an input even exists. So if they see a transaction, and it says, okay, I'm spending from here, and here's a signature. They don't even know that the here that's being spent is a thing. Um, it's also got some privacy and other problems. But the basic idea is they figure, well, if everyone else is doing this and everyone else seems to be okay with it, it's probably fine. Uh, if the miners are, are okay with it, I should be too. Um, so here's what sort of SPV supports. Um, you can propagate messages, sure. Pseudonode can do that. Anyone can do that. Um, you can send coins, sure, that's easy. You could serve blocks, I guess. I've never seen an SPV node that has a blocks folder and 
you know, sends blocks, but you could do it. It wouldn't be that hard to program. Uh, but usually SPV, the idea is you want a like fairly low footprint and not take up too much space. So this would take, you know, this would be an SPV node that took up 250 gigabytes of space. You could. Um, can you check works? Yeah, you can check the work done on blocks. So you can check that, you can check what consensus everyone else is on, hopefully everyone else, uh, to some extent, right? You can't check though the transactions or signatures. So you're not checking that the most, you're checking the, the most work chain but you're not checking that that's the most, the valid most work chain. So someone could be making a, someone could get a lot of mining power, start printing themselves a bunch of coins, and if you're SPV, you're just gonna go along with it, because you're like, yeah, the most work is valid. Um, but if you're a full node, you're, it's not, there's a huge caveat to that. It's not the most full, most work is valid. It's, sorry, it's not that the most work is valid, it's that the most valid work is the what you choose. Um, so yeah, so you can, with SPV, can't really do this. With SPV, can you re re receive coins? Yeah, yeah, ish. Uh, it, it generally works. Um, there are SPV wallets, you receive coins. We don't know of any real attacks where people you know, get mining uh, capacity. Uh, zero confirmation though is, is much more dangerous. Uh, and then can you mine with SPV? Well, please don't. Uh, we certainly know that people have done this. Uh, we've got evidence where there's blocks that are building off of a most work chain that is not valid according to the consensus rules. So people have done this, uh, they've all lost money. So please don't. Um, full node though, you can do all these things. Everything's green, right? You could propagate messages, you don't have to. You could have a wallet attached to it, receive and send coins. Uh, you can serve blocks to other people, thanks. You're running a, an archive node and, and that can be a lot of bandwidth. Uh, I run a, we run a node here at uh, MIT Digital Currency Initiative. It's two terabytes a month of outgoing bandwidth. People keep connecting and asking for blocks. Uh, it's very s variable depending on the first derivative of Bitcoin price. So if the price is going up, everyone's downloading Bitcoin and, and starting to run it and everyone's like sinking and downloading blocks. And then when the price goes down, people stop. And so there's not too much network traffic. Um, but yeah, this is a nice thing to do, helps other people. Um, if, as a full node, you can do all these things. You can check the work, you can check the transactions, and you can even mine, you know, good luck. Um, so we, I wanna look at like the state versus the history, and that's what sort of prompted the ideas uh, of UTXO, U U3XO. Um, keeping track of the current state is really the hard part. Um, it's very disk intensive, there's a lot of, you know, databases, things like that. Um, and you can't share that with others. So if you know that the current state of the system is this, you know, UTXO set, you can't give it to anyone else uh, in a usable way because you might be lying. You might have just added your own coins in there and given yourself a couple thousand coins. Um, keeping track of history is easier and it's only done to help others. So if you keep all the blocks, you can give it to others because that's something that can uh, verify all the signatures and verify all the work. So when you're keeping the UTXO set, when you're keeping the state of who owns what in Bitcoin, there's no signatures there. Right, you've, you've thrown away the signatures, they don't go in that database, because you verified it and you've just got this sort of entries in your computer of this, this, you know, this UTXO has this much. Um, so it's interesting trade-off, can we get someone else to do the hard part for us, right? That's sort of the idea. Um, and if you look at it, it's you know, a lot of history and not too much current state. Uh, so that's the size as of a day or two ago. Um, and the history only goes up, right? You can't delete that necessarily. Um, and the current state mostly goes up. Sometimes it goes down because there, there could be fewer entries in the who owns what database. Um, so the research I've been doing last year or so um, is U3XO. So the idea is it's a new mode for these where it's a full node, they're fully verifying, but it doesn't actually keep track of who owns what. It keeps this very compact representation uh, it doesn't have an index of all the different UTXOs. Um, so it can't look up coins on the disk. Uh, so people spending coins need to prove that their coins exist. Um, so what it does is it makes spending a little harder and other things easier. So you can still do all these things, right? You can still propagate messages. You can send coins, but that's now a bit more work because you don't just uh, sign and sort of send your transaction out. You need to prove that your coins exist at all. Um, serve blocks, same, check work, same. But the checking the transactions and signatures now becomes easier um, because you don't have to keep track of all these things because it's the responsibility of the people who own the coins to keep track of the, 
you know, them, them for you, which seems like a good trade-off, right? Because one of the issues in, in Bitcoin, um, like a few years ago, the UTXO set got started getting very big. Um, there was a lot of uh, mempool traffic, the fees went way up, and a lot of it was that uh, exchanges had sort of bad practices for managing their, their UTXO set. Um, and the problem is if you have an exchange and you just create you know, a million UTXOs, that's a million UTXOs that are on everyone's computer that's running Bitcoin. Um, so it's sort of this tragedy of the commons thing where if, if you know, one actor sort of pollutes the space or uses up a lot of space, everyone has to keep track of that. Um, and in this model, it's sort of nicer. If you're an exchange and you've got a million UTXOs, well, you're, you're gonna need to keep track of those and keep the proofs for a million UTXOs and other people don't have to. Um, and then these, these things are the same. Um, so how does UTXO work? Well, I gave a talk about that at the last Bitcoin Expo, so I don't wanna go to the whole thing, um, but it's this hash-based accumulator. So the idea is you see things and you sort of throw them into this accumulator. It's sort of a, a box of data and it's a bottomless box that you can't actually pull things back out of. You just sort of toss data in and you don't really quite remember what's in there, but when someone proves it again, you can say, oh yeah, that's something I threw in there. Um, so it it's uses Merkle trees, basically. It's a forest of Merkle trees, and nodes only need to store the roots of these Merkle trees. So total data storage needed is like a kilobyte. Uh, it grows with log, log n, so if, uh, the logarithm of the number of UTXOs. So right now there's about 70 million UTXOs, so you're gonna need, worst case, I think 26 hashes to store. Um, some interesting charts I just wanted to put towards the end. Um, there's a lot of fun optimizations you can do uh, when you, in order to like do, uh, store less data. One of the things to do is to, in, to decrease the proof sizes, you can exploit the fact that um, UTXO spending is, is not uniform at all. And this is a, a chart of how long coins last, sort of coin lifespans. Uh, and it's a log log plot, so I couldn't put I couldn't put zero, right? Ten to the zero, it's log, so it doesn't fit. Uh, but the most common sort of duration of a Bitcoin output is zero blocks. The most common duration is an output is created in a block and then destroyed in the very same block it's spent. Um, I don't know, but people are you know could it's, it's sort of inefficient because you could sort of do cut through, but people don't. Um, so that's the single most common. It's not the majority at all. Um, but it's the single most common duration for UTXO. And then the second most is one block, where something gets created in you know, block A and then spent in block A plus one. Uh, and you can see it go down. The fun part is that like at six blocks, there's a big bump uh, where people wait six blocks and then spend their coins uh, because that's what it says in the paper, right? Six blocks. Um, there's also 100, which makes sense because miners uh, have to wait 100 blocks to spend their coins. And that's a protocol enforced rule. So they're waiting, waiting, and then, okay, they can sell. Um, there's a big jump at 433, I don't know, and a thousand, I don't know. Um, so, and, but the idea is most of these UTXOs live a short amount of time. So with, this implies we can get really good caching strategies, where if, even though we're sort of forgetting the whole UTXO set, well, the stuff in you know, the last 10 blocks is very, very likely to be spent soon. So maybe we remember a little bit, and then we can store, uh, then we can store that and not have to get proofs. Um, and so this is sort of a chart of the added proof data that needs to be sent when people are proving that their coins exist. Um, if you cache a bit and say, okay, well, instead of doing one kilobyte, I'll, I'll use a little bit of memory, right? A couple megabytes or maybe two, four gigs. Um, if you cache these, uh, your, your data requirements go down pretty quick. And so this is not a log scale graph, probably should be if you wanna actually see what's going on but it's linear axes which make it look very steep and very good performance. Um, so yeah, if you, have, if you have a few hundred megabytes of RAM, which most people do, uh, you can get the overhead for using this new uh, node type to pretty small. So this is, um, this, is, this is data from like last year when the blockchain was about 250 gigs. It's, it's a bit more now. Um, so, so up here, it's about a 2x penalty of you have to download twice as much. But then once you get down here, yeah, it's like 20 something percent. So 20% extra uh, network traffic if you have a, a you know, reasonable amount of memory. Um, so, and then I wanna say that UTXO is not a consensus change. Uh, miners don't have to use it or care about it. Um, you start with sort of a bridge node, something that can prove all the UTXOs and sort of takes on the burden for everyone. And I think that's a good idea, right? It's, 
It's not trusted, so similar to an archive node, you can run it on AWS, um, and everyone who's receiving data from it is checking all of it. So the worst case is they send you something wrong and you hang up on them. Um, but that, that bridge node sort of take, keeps track of everything so that you don't have to. Um, and so this is nice, permissionless innovation. Don't have to like lobby and ask people to, well, I mean, I do want people to review it and, and look at it, obviously, but I, I don't, it's not quite as big of a ask to like, hey, I want this soft fork. Um, although there certainly would be improvements you could do with a soft fork to this. Um, so what's left to build? Um, the obvious, obvious benefit of this is uh, that you have now a full node, a fully val validating node and about one kilobyte of storage. That's cool. Uh, the state size is so small it fits on a QR code. So you could do crazy things like go to a website and ask what the full state is and say, okay, I'm done with sync. And yeah, please don't do that, but people probably will. Um, but you could do reasonable things. Like I have a desktop at home. I have synced the entire blockchain. And then I want to copy that onto my phone. And I just sort of take a snapshot of the QR code that says here's the current state of Bitcoin. Uh, you could do that. And that's okay because that's a computer you trust and you own transferring to a different one. You can do that today, right? You can, you can copy your, blo your chain state folder from one Bitcoin uh, node to another, even between architectures. Like you can copy a Raspberry Pi, you know, desktop to a Raspberry Pi. It generally works, but people don't do it because it's pretty big. It's pretty awkward. Um, it could also present some nice performance improvements. Um, oh yeah, that's what I just said. Um, because you can parallelize these things. So when the state size is really small, and, and if you saw uh, James O'Byrne's uh, Assume TXO, he's sort of creating, and it's a lot of hard work, you're creating these sort of two parallel validation paths where there's a lot of different things going on. That gets a lot easier with UTXO because the whole thing can fit in not even RAM, but CPU cache. Um, so you could start multiple threads verifying things at different points in the blockchain. Um, so now it becomes like really embarrassingly parallel without the worry about disk IO. So that would be cool. Um, so yeah, so I'm done. I can maybe do a little questions, but yeah, the general idea, when people ask about UTXO, it's like, oh, so you're gonna have full nodes on phones. It's like, well, maybe. Uh, you still have this bandwidth and, and you still have to do all the CPU work because you are fully, fully validating. So it certainly makes it easier on phones, but I worry about battery life. Like it'll still use a lot of battery. Um, so there's, there's open source code on uh, github.com slash mit-dci slash UTXO. And I want to give shout outs to, there's, it's really cool. I think this is the first time that I've worked on things that like people I don't really know that well are just like coming on GitHub and like working on it and talking to me and it's, it's great. Um, actually, Calvin I met at a conference in South Korea and it's cool because like he's like, oh, coronavirus, I have like no classes, so I'm gonna help on this. <laughs> uh, and you said, Kok, I don't actually know in real life, but it's great that people are working on it. So if you have questions about it, come on to GitHub or there's an IRC channel, uh, just Hashtag UTXO, or hashtag, I don't know, IRC symbol, UTXO. Um, so yeah, if, and can answer questions about this stuff in the next oh, three minutes. Hey, thanks, great talk. Um, I would love to hear your opinion about this trade-off uh, between RSA accumulators, constant time accumulators, and U3XO. So what do you think, in what are we going to see in the next one, two years? Uh, which one is more practical? Yeah, I'm just interested in your take. Okay, so yeah, there's there, yeah, there are other uh, accumulator designs. There's a paper, uh, Bonnet, 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 Benedict, Benedict uh, BBF or someone, uh, yeah. at Stanford, and they've written a paper about RSA accumulators and uh, applications to this. Um, Let's see, the, the, there's still some novel crypto going on there, where I would say UTXO is a more conservative design where it's like, it's Merkle trees, and you're already using that stuff in Bitcoin, so uh, we're not making any new assumptions. With the RSA-based one, you need a, something akin to a trusted setup like Zcash, either that or some fairly novel cryptography where you're making a group of unknown order trustlessly. And they, you know, there's a lot of really cool research on this, even recently. Um, but it's still pretty novel, and so I think in Bitcoin world, it's a, people would be pretty hesitant to say like, okay, here's this new cryptography thing and assumption that's a year or two old, and let's, let's put our money on it. Where, um, but I think there, in general, the performance ideas of the RSA one are better. Yep. Um, it's smaller. 
Um, but the thing is, with UTXO, a lot of the work was like getting the sizes down. And in practice, it's like, oh, it's like a 20% data overhead. Like, it's not too bad. You can you can get a lot of techniques to make it not too bad. Okay. Um, so I think they're both they're both potentially viable. Um, but the trust assumptions in UTXO are, are a bit yeah. nicer. Thank you. Cool. But yeah, definitely more research on both. I, I'm maybe you can merge them or something. <laughs> Any other questions? What, uh, what's the state of this repo? Like, if I wanted to run a bridge node, could I compile this code and have a bridge node? There's code. It compiles. It's still pretty buggy. Um, we, we find bugs. But yeah, there, and currently working on network messages. So there's like a simulator where it's like, here's the bridge node, here's the little node, and they talk to each other, but it's all on the same CPU. So there's currently not network messages going back and forth, because that's, I'm sure as the people working on Lightning can tell you, network messages are fun. And state machines, when multiple computers are talking to each other, real fun. Uh, but, but I am working on that part. So, so it should be pretty soon that you'll have sort of a bridge node and a test node, and they talk to each other. And it's all testnet right now, because I don't want people to use anything rough. So, cool. OK, break time. Great. Uh, that concludes the first session of the day. We have a break until 11.15, so 15 minutes. Uh, see you soon.